Welcome. It's really nice to have you here with us today. It's a beautiful sunny day, spring day here in Bremerton. I hope where you are it's nice also. Today joining me are uh, my daughter Nicole and my mom on the couch and Nancy sitting right here next to me. Again, it's really nice to have you with us today. We're here to worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to sing his praises, to remember that he loves us not because it's an attribute of his character, but because he is in his own essential being, love itself. He is love. And so he loves us whether we're good or bad, whether we're naughty or nice. He loves us not because of our performance or who we are or because of what we, what we do, but he loves us entirely because of who he is. I'm just so grateful that in, in our God is a built-in relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who live in perfect union in this perfect bond of love between them. And they have invited us, you and I, to live in that family of love. So we begin today. I pray that you will know how much you are loved and that that love never changes. It's not more one day and less one day, but you are loved constantly, continually, without end, by our Heavenly Father, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, just I thank you for this beautiful day, for this morning. I thank you for everyone gathered and gathering, and those who will be watching and listening later on YouTube. I just pray that you would be in and through this entire service, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill me and fill each one of us with an extraordinary measure of your Spirit's presence and power and grace, that you would let the love of God be full in our hearts, that you would strengthen us in our inner being through the Holy Spirit so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we being rooted and grounded in love might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know this love which the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled up to the fullness of God. I pray that you would bring to fruition in our life the fruit of the Spirit, that we would fan into flame the gifts of the Spirit that you have given to us that you would teach us to pray in the Spirit continually, that you would teach us to walk in the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit, to hear your sp Spirit's still small voice in and through your Word and in, in and through our, our lives, Lord, in, in our spirits. I pray that you would teach us to pray in the Spirit continually as I, I've asked, Lord. May we learn to live and move and have our being in your Spirit, Lord. We entrust this service into your hands and would pray that you alone would be glorified. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we begin with a couple of uh, songs, Raise and Alleluia, and then In Christ Alone, which is a modern hymn. Let's worship.
Again, it's good to have you here with us today. Let's pray. Well, a couple of things to pray for. I, I saw that uh, Chris Pablo, Jr. is being discharged today from the hospital after having open heart surgery on Tuesday, and he's doing really well. He has a couple more arteries that are partially blocked, and so he's going to have to get stents put in once he's uh, recovered from the surgery. Dottie also, I talked to her, and she's recovering well. They didn't find anything that was causing the internal bleeding after doing a lot of tests, and so she's home and, and doing well. And I myself, um, I've been having chest pain now off and on for three and four, about three or four weeks. Ended up in the ER again. I'll go more into it later, but um, I'm feeling okay today. But I'm going to be seeing my car cardiolo cardiologist on Thursday, so I'd appreciate your prayers. Let's pray. Father, just I thank you for today, and I thank you that things are working again. I thank you for everyone who's gathered with us today. And I just pray that you would give us grace today, that you would give us peace. I know your love is always with us. You never are in a state of not loving us. We live in your love. We live in the house of your love, with the firm floor of your grace beneath our feet, our only standing. We stand in grace. I thank you for uh, JR, Lord, for Chris. I thank you that the surgery went well, that they were able to do three by bypasses on him. I pray that as he recovers, they were also able to clean out one of his, the arteries in his neck, carotid arteries, and thank you that that got cleared out. And for these last couple of arteries that need to be, have stents put in, I pray that you would open up the perfect time for that. I pray that he would continue to recover well. I thank you that Dottie's home, that she's feeling better. And I pray that you would open up uh, just the right time to have her valve replaced over it to you. Just entrust her into your care. And I pray for myself, Lord, that you would bring healing to my body, healing to all of our bodies, Lord, that you would restore me to health, Lord. I know when I am weak, then you are strong, and I give you praise for that. Father, give us wisdom in knowing just which Sunday to open up. Um, I pray that as a leadership team meets, not this Tuesday, but um, the following Tuesday, Lord, that you would give us great wisdom beyond our own capacities to know when just the right Sunday is to open up. I pray that as we rejoin together that we would work out all the technological difficulties of both doing a in building service and, and continuing to live stream. I pray that you would bring everything together, Lord, that everything would fall in place. I pray that you would strengthen us by your spirit, Lord, that where we are grieving, you would comfort us. Where we are hurting, that you would be our comforter and our strength, Lord. Where we are struggling with broken relationships and strained relationships, I pray that you would be our friend. You are our friend, Lord, and that you would restore those broken relationships. Where we are worried, I pray that you would be our peace. Where we are lonely, that you would be our, our companion. Where we are feeling like failures, Lord, that we would know that in you we are you have completely succeeded on our behalf. Father, we just entrust this day and this coming week into your hands. We thank you that everywhere you go, there you are. You are always with us. Free, free of us, free us of the rules, rules of our own making, Lord. And let us walk freely in the wide open spaces of your love and the power of your grace that transforms our lives. Teach us to rest in you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning for our scripture reading is the overall context for the verses I'm going to be looking at today and also next Sunday, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And then after that, verse 10, we begin in Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 1. 
and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too we all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. We also have some announcements to cover. Our women's Bible study will resume this coming Saturday, May 22nd, beginning at 3.30 p.m. We didn't have it this last week. Um, Jacques was to the point where he was very uncomfortable living, and so uh, we had him put down yesterday, and Nancy uh, spent time with the fa our family instead of doing the Bible study. So thank you. Uh, we love the little guy. We're going to miss him. But it will resume this coming Saturday. Our leadership team meeting will be held on Tuesday, June 1st, beginning at 6.30 uh, p.m. So it's actually not next week. It's the following week. I forgot this is a five-Sunday month. So, and our Covenant Group Bible study will not be meeting until Thursday, June 3rd, 2021, and will begin at 7 p.m. via Zoom. We'll see. Uh, we're, it will be on Zoom for sure, but I'm not sure. We won't be starting the Bible study yet, but it will be uh, sometime soon after that when we can start, I hope, depending on how it goes with this reopening. So, And lastly, contributions may be sent to the church at 1211 Venita Avenue, Bremerton, Washington, 98337. And I also have uh, the an announcement that our annual meeting is right after the service today, starting at 1 p.m. with the Zoom room starting up at 12.45 p.m. I emailed the link to all of you, both to the meeting and also the documents that you need for the meeting. If you are a member, please join. If you're not a member, you're welcome to join us. You, you have the right of voice, but not the right of vote. Also, you may go to our GCC private page and both the documents are there, and also the link to the Zoom meeting is also there. And I also texted it via and emailed it via remind.com, so I tried to get it to you as, in as many ways as I could. So we hope to see you at, at between 12.45 and 1 p.m. for that meeting. Let's begin with prayer. Father, again, I just thank you for this day. As I prayed earlier, and no one could hear, I pray that you would fill us all with an extraordinary measure of your Holy Spirit. That you would fill me today with an extraordinary measure of your Spirit, with that empowerment. I pray that I would not rely on myself or my own insights, but entirely on your grace, on the empowerment of, of your Spirit, on your living within me, Jesus. I pray that you'd give me clarity of thought, clarity of purpose, mind, direction, that you would help me to enunciate clearly. Pray that you would keep me from saying the things I don't need to and bring me to say everything I, you would desire me to. I pray that you would speak through me, Lord, a word of grace and truth and power. And for everyone listening now and later on YouTube, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and open lives to receive the wonder of your grace, the wonder of your unconditional love for us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been in a series looking at 1 Corinthians 2.12. That first Sunday we looked at it in its context. 
But we read, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. And so we saw that the purpose of the spirit being given to us, one of the primary purposes, is to open up the things that God has freely given to us. Not the things that we, are, we have to do, not the things that we have to perform, not the tap steps we have to learn, but the things that he has done for us. We also saw that it can be translated as, let me read it again. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things by which God has graced us. I'm going to stop just a moment. Nicole, can you do me a favor? She got her flashlight on. It's shining right in my eyes. So, All right. My mom accidentally turned on the flashlight on her laptop, and it's shining right in my eyes. So there we go. Thank you. So again, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's, who is from God, so that we may know the things by which God has graced us, so that the freely given things literally is the verb for grace. It, can, it has a variety of nuances to the word, but the things by which God has graced us. So one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to open up the wide open spaces of God's grace. The myriad, myriad of things, the multiplicity of things that he has given to us in his grace. So one of those things is found in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's salvation. So reading Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So we get to that word grace, and we often hear it, it's, it's literally the word in the Greek is charis. I usually don't like doing this, but there's a purpose for showing you it. It's an X, which is actually the, the letter CH, an alpha, an A, and the thing that looks like a P is an R, actually, a row, R, and then a yoda, like an R-I, and then an S, a sigma. So charis. Um, we, re we usually define it as unmerited favor or undeserved favor or unmerited undeserved favor. I, I read in my, that primary dictionary, that the granddaddy of all Greek dictionaries, I read this definition, a beneficent disposition towards someone, favor, grace. So it's a disposition uh, for someone, and that, that is a good, good definition, but that's not what grace really is about. It's not just God's attitude towards us. It's much more than that. And so I've come up with a def definition, and I didn't make this up. It just kind of came to me um, through preaching through texts over the years. And it's a def definition that's not a perfect definition of grace, but I think it gets at it more. And it's this definition. It's grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind, and generous power of God. So it's not just his friendly or favorable disposition towards you, but it's his kind and generous power by which he saves us, forgives us, or forgive, save, and transforms our lives forever. So grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind, and generous power of God to forgive, save, and transform forever broken and sinful lives. So I thought this morning, I was going to originally just preach through Ephesians 2, 8, 9 as one of the freely given things, that salvation is, is one of those primary things by which we have been graced. Salvation is freely given to us. But I thought, you know, I, I really want to unpack what grace means. And so I, t I thought I'd take this definition and unpack this definition and show, show you where it comes from in Scripture, that I didn't just make this up, that it's born out of Scripture. And I could add a lot more to this defi definition. But the, if you get this, the center idea is God's power. And that power is a kind and generous power. So let's dig into this definition. I start with Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, in that waterfall of words that Paul pours out in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 17. It's all one sentence. We divide it up into many sentences, but it's he's just outpouring this praise to God and declaring the, 
the richness and fullness of the gospel. And so we read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. There's that word kindness that we'll be getting to. To the praise of the glory of his grace. And so it was to the praise of the glory of his grace. So God's grace has glory to it. It has weight to it, meaning purpose. It has this idea of splendor and magnificence to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So herein you get this guy idea that grace is freely bestowed. And ironically, that word freely bestowed is the word keratao. And you'll see, if you look at those letters, you don't have to read Greek, but you'll see that the first four letters in each word, charis and karataro, are exactly the same. And so this word freely bestowed is a, another verb that's, whose root is grace. They're cognates. They come from the same stem, from the same root. And so it's to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely graced us on in the beloved. That's what it's getting at. And so you can see the connection between grace and freely given or freely bestowed. And there's this idea of gift and grace. And that's where they get the idea of unmerited and undeserved because you can't merit a gift. If you merit a gift, it's not a gift. If you deserve a gift, no, you've earned it. And so you can't earn a gift. You can't merit it. You can't deserve it. It's just freely given. You give a gift out of love for someone. If, if it's given for any other purpose, it's not a gift. And so even the word gift, one of the words that we translate by our English word gift is charisma with the same first four letters. And that word charismata is actually the word we get charisma from it. But that's the word for gift. And so even in many passages, the idea of gift is a grace gift. And so this idea of an unmerited, undeserved gift is tied right in to the idea of what grace is. And so we have to freely bestow, to freely give, to freely gift. And so we begin our definition with grace is the undeserved, unmerited the gifted, if you will, the gift. We move on and we come to the word kind. And we just saw that in our text in Ephesians chapter 1, according to the kind intention of his will, and then his grace to the praise of the glory of his grace. I'm, I automatically think of the fuller context of what we just read in our scripture this morning. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. That's the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is not just doctrine. It's the heart of God loving us. That's, and he always loves us. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Christ, and seated us with Christ, I'm telling you the pronouns, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and then here's the purpose, so that in the ages to come, that word ages is the word eon, age, or it can't even be the word by, by which we translate it into the word eternity, so that in the eternities to come, the eons to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. So in grace, there's this idea of riches, surpassing riches. It's an overwhelming treasure, if you will, an overwhelming fountain of grace. And then notice what it says. He might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness. And so grace here is connected directly to his kindness to us. Have you ever thought about God being kind? That's not the God I grew up with or the Jesus I grew up with but I've come to know the kind heart of God and the kind heart of Jesus. He is so kind to us. And you think about our future, not just here on the planet in these short 70 to 100 years that we have or, or shorter, but the scope of what 
the ages to come, the eons to come, or if you will, the plural eternities to come, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That kindness is found nowhere else but in the heart of Jesus and therefore in the heart of God, because when we see Jesus, we see the heart of God. We will never exhaust grace. We will never exhaust his kindness to us. And so we get added to our definition, grace is the undeserved, unmerited kind. And then moving on, we come to the idea of generous. His grace is generous. It's not just a little bit of grace, but it's overflowing grace. Like Niagara Falls coming over the, the cliff and plunging that, that constant flow. That's, that's a wonderful image of grace. Or ocean waves, we'll be getting there a bit. And so there's this idea of generosity. I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 18 through 20. This is in that context of Paul bringing a gift for the churches in Judea because there was a famine. And so it says, We have sent along with him the brother whose fame in the things of the gospel has spread throughout all the churches. I believe this is Titus that he's speaking of. And not only this, but he also he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work, bringing this gift, which is being administered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness, taking precautions so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. Well, I don't... You know, we have gracious work, but literally, if you take that word gracious work, it's, it's, they've translated it as gracious work, but literally it's, but he has also been appointed to the churches to travel with us in this grace, this bringing you this gift so that you can have food in the midst of famine. But you can see that it's then grace is, is called this generous gift, and that's a human work. But then I go over to John 1, 16 and 17. Again, some of my favorite, I have so many favorite verses. But these are wonderful verses. For of his fullness, of the fullness of Jesus, we have all received. And grace upon grace. And literally it says grace after grace or grace in place of grace. Some people will say that the law was grace and then in place of that was given uh, the grace of the new covenant, that might be part of it. But I, I think the idea here is that grace isn't just a static thing that you receive one time and then you received it and you're done. No, we get graced when we are saved, which we're going to be looking at more fully next week. But then we are graced day by day, moment by moment, month by month, year by year. And I've, I've brought up this image before, but it reminds me of ocean waves coming crashing in on the beach. One ocean wave of his grace crashes over our lives, spilling over our lives. And then as that grace recedes, another ocean wave is, of his grace spills over, crashes over our lives. And it's incessant. It doesn't stop. It continues. Grace after grace after grace after grace. And this is where we live, is in the constant flow of his grace into our lives. Just like manna in the desert. They couldn't gather enough for tomorrow. You could only get enough and you could gather as much as you wanted or as little of you as you wanted. But I think in the context of John also, you think of the grace upon grace, grace after grace. I think of the wedding at Cana when he, the bride and groom ran out of wine, which was a no-no. It would have shamed the bride and groom. It was a seven-day wedding feast, and Jesus was invited to the feast along with his 12 disciples, or at least uh, many of his disciples. And so they ran out of wine. There was a lot of extra mouths drinking the wine. And Jesus' mother said, do something. And he says, it's not, woman, it's not my time yet. And then she, with great faith, says, do whatever Jesus tells you, my son tells you. And so he has them go and fill six stone water uh, jars that would have carried between 30 and 50 gallons a piece. Is that right? Yeah. So, or was it? Yeah. 30 and 50 gallons a piece. So when they brought the wine 
to the maitre d' of the, the wedding feast, he was blown away because he says, you know, usually at, at a wedding, you bring out the good stuff first, and then when people get tipsy, then you give them the not-so-good stuff because they're tipsy, and they won't care, they won't even mind, they won't even notice. But you've saved the best for last. And here we have 150 to 180 gallons of wine given to this couple. Grace upon grace. He doesn't do anything just in a little way. When he feeds the 5,000 with maybe 15,000 women and children in addition, he doesn't give them just enough for a meal. He gives them all-you-can-eat buffet. And afterwards, he has the disciples go and pick up the pieces, and there's 12 basketfuls, full, big baskets, full of leftover pieces. And he only began with two fish and five loaves. Everywhere we see, we see this generosity in Jesus. This generosity to give more than expected, more than anticipated, more than imagined. Now to, who, now to him who is able to do far more than all we can ask or even imagine, according to the power, his power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church, both now and forevermore overflowing grace and so grace is generous it's extravagantly generous it's generous to a fault he gives grace to the people that we least expect should receive grace because we think well you got to deserve you there has to be some dessert some merit in your receiving grace but with God there is no merit there is no deserving it he gives it freely because of his great love with which he has loved us and so we see that grace is the undeserved unmerited kind and generous kind and generous and so grace is comes to us in kindness this power this favor that he gives us it's undeserved it's, it comes to us as a gift not because of anything we've done and then we move on and it we get into grace as the power of god Grace is not just favor. It's not just an attitude of God's heart. It includes that. Of course, he has beneficent uh, goodwill towards you. But it, grace is far more than that. It's the power of God to save, forgive, and transform broken and sinful lives forever. Where do I get this idea of the power of God? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10, we read, For I am the least of the apostles, Paul speaking, and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I was killing Christians. I was killing the body of Christ. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove in vain, or did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. So notice the center place of grace in this passage, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And same with me, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I was a miserable punk drug dealer and alcoholic and drug addict, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by the grace of God, you are who you are now in him. And his grace towards, toward me and towards us did not prove in vain. And then Paul says, but I labored even more than all of them and he's always talking about these other these super apostles who are bringing in legalism and trying to undercut his ministry. And he says, but I lab labored. I worked harder than all the rest of these. And you think, well, now he's talking about his own work and his own laboring, his own power, if you will. And yet Paul catches himself and he says, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. And so this idea of grace laboring and, and working and, and, and so on but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, the grace of God within me. So he was saying that grace is a power that would work within him as an apostle of the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring that, world, that word to the world around him. I know the power of his grace. I can see it in the wake of my life. You can see it in looking back at your life. It's hard to see right now in, in this day, but it's there, those waves of grace keep crashing in. And then one other scripture comes to mind on the power of God as part of his, as the de definition of grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. But he, he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. 
Paul had a thorn in his flesh. Many people think it was an illness or maybe poor eyesight. I think in the context, it was the Judaizers who were plaguing him everywhere he went, and they were a thorn in his flesh. Everywhere he went, if you read through the book of Acts, there were Judaizers, and they would persecute Paul and run him out of town and, and go to the next town and, and run him out of town. And, and when he asked three times to have this thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, removed, Jesus says, no, I'm not going to remove it. Rather, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. And you notice in the grammar here that grace and power are made synonymous. My grace is sufficient for you. For power, grace, is perfected in weakness. So the grace of God is perfected in your life. This powerful grace and this gracious power is perfected in your life and in my life when we are weak. So this week I, I, I told you I'd fill you in. This week I found out. I went into ER at about 11 o'clock on Sunday evening on Mother's Day. Not the best time to go into the ER. I hang in there, hung in there throughout the day. But by at about 11, I started having a rush go up my neck, a headache, chest pain radi radiating down my arm, a brick on my chest. I got totally pale. And so Nancy called 911. They came and the... the the medic said, well, you'll be home in just no time. They're going to take you there, what they always do. Do all the tests, find nothing, and then you're going to be sent home. And I'm thinking, yeah, but I'm having all this pain, and it's in my hand. My hand is numb. And So they brought me into the hospital, and they put me in a ER room, and I ended up, Nancy sat with me until 6.30 in the morning, when finally uh, they had decided to keep me for, uh, in the hospital. And so she went home to get some sleep, and I fell asleep about 6.30, and they woke me up at 7.30 at shift change. The two nurses woke me up, and they just introduced their names when a team of people came in and said, we're from the cath lab, we're taking you for a heart catheterization. And my understanding, the plan had been I would first of all get a, get a uh, stress test on a treadmill or a chemical uh, stress test, then I would go through the required medications and then I would have an angiogram but they were sending me right for the angiogram and so I quickly called Nancy and told them that they were taking me and uh, when I after the angiogram that afternoon I found out that I have three partially blocked or three stenosis is how they call it narrowing of the three arteries I'm blessed that the LAD the big artery isn't isn't narrowed at all but uh, two of them are uh, narrowed by 50%. One is narrowed by 70%. So I've been diagnosed now with uh, non un un unobstructive coronary artery disease. And it's um, the d diagnosis is considered a severe diagnosis. And so I'm kind of reeling, thinking, God, what are you doing? I already have stage 4 cancer. And it's ex exas exacerbated by the Lupron I'm on by this medication I'm taking, one of the side effects is plaque buildup in the arteries, myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, and high cholesterol, which I've already had the high cholesterol. And so probably I had some of this plaque there to begin with, and then as I went on Lupron two years ago, it's now accelerated, it accelerates greatly that buildup of plaque. And so now the very thing I'm taking to preserve my life is contributing to my having heart disease now. And I'm still in uh, quite a bit of chest pain throughout the day. Yesterday I had three or four episodes. Today I've only had one early this morning. But I appreciate your prayers. But, you know, I was praying, Lord, why is all this happening? And it was these words, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. More gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So get this, grace is here, is directly connected with the power of God. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And I like to talk about his gracious power and his powerful grace. If you think about power, we have uh, one of the words for power is the word from which we get dynamite. And so there is this explosiveness to power. You think about atom bombs. We were talking about the atom bomb last night. And 
the war and living in Japan and so on. And, and you think about the power of Niagara Falls as it falls over the falls or the power of some of the dams that we have, like the Grand Coulee Dam, all that water and the power it has. Power can, can be dangerous. It can be destructive. I remember the, seeing the videos of, of the tsunami in Japan that was about uh, 10 or 11 years ago. I don't remember how many years exactly, but watching those videos of that water coming in and it just looking like a big wave and then destroying everything. And it killed, what, 20,000 people, 18 to 20,000 people, if not more. And so that's why we qualify power. It's the kind and gracious, the kind and generous power. It's his gracious power and his powerful grace. So grace is not just God's attitude towards you. Yes, it includes that. But it's his power in your life. Which means it's not your power. It's not what comes from you. It's what entirely comes from him. And how he can change your life. How he can transform your life. And so we, we see... Uh, Grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power of God. I'm glad it's not fierce and destructive power of God. That's what I grew up with. But it's his kind and generous power. The kind and generous power of God. And then we get to the idea of forgive. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Well, I don't see forgiveness anywhere in there. But there are some texts. In Ephesians 1 7, again, in that waterfall of the torrent of words that Paul spills out in Ephesians chapter 1, in him we have redemption through his blood. He purchased us by his blood and then set us free. The forgiveness of our trespasses, trespasses were going trespassing the law, going beyond the limits of the law. It's like when you see a no trespass sign on the fence and you go over the fence and in there, you are trespassing. You are going beyond the boundary. And so the law provided a boundary. The Old Testament law provided a boundary. And it's the idea of going beyond the boundary of the law, going beyond the boundary of the will of God. But really, it's going beyond the boundary of his love for us. It's forgetting that he loves us. It's missing the mark. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his, of his grace. So that forgiveness is according to the riches of his, of his grace. So here again we have forgiveness tied right in with grace. What he did on the cross for us. In him becoming sin. Not just pardoning our sin, but he became our sin so that when he, he died, all of our sin died with him. All of your sin died with Jesus when, when he died. Wow. In Ephesians 4.32 we read, be, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. I did a huge study on forgiveness years ago, probably 15 years ago. Looked at every occurrence of all the different Greek words by which we translate forgive. And what I found was before the cross it was conditional. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. But after the cross it's, it reverses. And so here we have forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And the sense of that verb there is that he forgave you lock, stock, and bar barrel at a moment in time. And that was the cross. The grammar conveys that. And it's, it's a verb that means he did it for himself. He forgave you for his sake because he so loves you. He wanted to have you with him for eternity. And that word forgiven there is the verb charizomai, again, starting with this, these first four letters. In our, and it would be C-H-A-R-I, charizomai. And it, it's, it can also mean it's the verb for grace. So it's the verb that we see in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. The Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we may know the freely given things, that we may know the things by which we have been graced. But here it also contains that idea of being charizomite has the idea of being forgiven. And so another way of saying it is our, our sins have been graced. We didn't deserve that forgiveness. We didn't reserve, deserve that release from our sins. 
but he has graced our sins. Therefore, we should in turn grace other people. What's this small thing that you've done against me when look at what I have done against God and how much he's forgiven me? And so we learn to forgive because of what God has forgiven us. If you're having problem forgiving someone, it's because you don't know how much God has forgiven you and just ask God to reveal it to you over time and he will. Or again in Colossians 3 verses 12 and 13. So as those who have been chosen of God, you've been chosen of God, holy and beloved. You are his beloved. He sings over you the song of his love. He sings over you in the morning and in the daytime and in the evening. The song of his of, of life, the song of his grace, the song of his love. He sings over you through the watches of the night. Holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Much of that is the fruit of the Spirit. Bearing with one another, forbearing one another, putting up with each other, and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, meaning just as the Lord already forgave you. Again, the tense of this verb is a, a moment in time when he forgave us, and that was at the cross. So also should you. So now we don't forgive in order to be forgiven. We forgive because we've already been forgiven everything, having forgiven us all of our sins. Does this give us a license to go out and sin freely? As Paul says, may it never be. No, I just want to hold on tighter to this one I'm in this dance of life with. I'll let his grip on my life get stronger and stronger and on your life as well. And so we see this idea of charisma. You can see the word there. In both of these words, you see the first four letters are the same in this word forgive. It's also to grace. It's to be graced. And so we add to our definition, building this definition. Grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind, and generous power of God to forgive. And so forgive is... That verb for grace is built right into it is the idea of being forgiven, of having our sins graced. We move on and it says, um, in our definition, I've added the word to save. And that's right in our text this morning. For by grace you have been saved. And so this idea of grace and salvation go hand in hand. There is no salvation outside of his grace. And his grace always leads us to salvation. And what, what do we mean by salvation? Are we just talking about, okay, uh, I live a better life now here on earth? No, it's, it's salvation in the fullness. He saves us from our sins. He saves us from death. He saves us from our own flesh. He saves us from the, the devil and the, from Satan and his accusations against us. He saves us from the righteous demands of the law by which we are condemned to death. And he saves us unto something. He saves us to life. In Romans it tells us that we're not saved by the cross, but we're saved by his resurrection. That when Christ stepped forth from the tomb, we were literally in the creator. We were in him and we stepped forth. And we were saved in Jesus. And so I add to that definition, grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power of God to forgive save. Next week we'll be unpacking Ephesians 2, 8, 9 fully with this definition in mind then. And then we move on to the idea of transform. That it just doesn't save you and then just leaves it up to you. I remember Charlotte Haworth was down in Centralia years ago, probably 20, 23 years ago. And she saw a big billboard that says, saved by grace, now it's up to you. And that's the message of a lot of churches. Saved by grace, now it's up to you. Well, this idea of transformation comes from a couple of verses. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Although it doesn't use the word grace, it certainly is talking about that power of God. And so now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. What image? The image of the Lord, the image of Christ. From glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Or this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so that transformation comes from the working of the Spirit in your life and in my life. The power of the Spirit working in your life. 
And so it's this gracious power transforming our lives, not just to save us, but each day we have those waves of grace crashing in on us, working out in on us. We're always so about what must I do? What do I have to do? What do you have to do? And it, Jesus essentially says, wrong question. In salvation, it's not what must you do. It's what must I do for you to be saved. But also in the living of the life, it's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus does, what the Holy Spirit does, what God the Father does. Oh, yes, we have our part in it, trusting him, surrendering, acquiescence, trust, believing him. Or again, in Colossians 2, 6, and 7, it says, Therefore, as you have received Christ, just as you receive Christ is the version I'm used to, therefore, as you re have received Christ, well, how did we receive Christ? By grace through faith, right? For by grace you've been saved through faith. And so that reception of Christ is part of our coming to faith in Christ. It's part of our coming to believe. Receiving Christ is, is to be saved. To be saved is to receive Christ. And so, therefore, just as you receive Christ by grace through faith, just as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So live your life. Walking was... Everything, where they went, they walk. Everywhere we go, we drive. But everywhere they went, they walk. They walk to the store. They walk to the market. They walk to their friend's house. They walk to the fields, wherever they walked. And so walking became a metaphor for living, for, for life. And so when he says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, it means so live in him. So how are we to live? By grace, through faith. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? How were you saved? by grace through faith. And and then look at this, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him. And so he's doing the building up, the transforming of our, of our life and, and establish or strengthen in the faith. And all of those verbs are passive, which means God is doing it to us. He has already rooted us in Christ. He's now building us up in him and he is also strengthening us in the faith. And then just as you were instructed, and our job is to overflow with gratitude or with thanksgiving. And so this idea of transformation isn't about what you must do for God. It's all about what God is going to do by the power of his grace. Therefore, we get the definition, grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind, and generous power of God to forgive, save, and transform. And then I add in forever. To transform forever. I think of John 5.24, we could go to a lot of verses on this one. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me, because he gives me the word, and so if you're believing my word, you're believing the one who sent me, and believes him who sent me, has eternal life. The connotation, the meaning of that, the, the nuance of that verb is that you receive it the moment you believe. The moment you've been persuaded that he loves you, that he has loved you so much that he has graced you with forgiveness in the cross, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Creator. When you're persuaded that he is the Creator and that he is the Messiah, the one who has come to save you by his death on the cross to forgive you, to give you brand new life, you move from death to life, has eternal life and does not come into judgment, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So get this, the moment you have been persuaded of who he is, that you've been persuaded of his love for you, you move from death to life. Your mind is opened up to understand what reality really is, and that's the love of God for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has already passed, is a sense of this, has passed out of death, meaning eternal death, into life, eternal life. So if you've been given eternal life, some people think you can lose it. Well, if you can lose eternal life, you didn't have eternal life because life is eternal. It goes on forever. And it's not, we always make it, well, it's, it's according to what we do. Well, if it's according to what we do, it's not going to be in, eternal because I'm going to find a way to lose it, and so will you. But it's all gift. It's all unmerited and undeserved, kind and generous 
power to forgive and save and transform forever. We've been given eternal life. And so that transformation is going to continue throughout my life. That salvation doesn't end because you blew it or because you backslid or you because you really blew it big. But has passed out of death into life. Right now, if you've been persuaded that of God's love for you, for God so loved the world, if you're persuaded that he is the son of God, that he is creator in the flesh, if you've been persuaded that he is the Messiah, the one who came to become your sin on the cross and to die, the moment you apprehend that, the moment you believe it, you don't have to say a prayer. You don't have to say the right words. You just have to say, I get it. I'm persuaded. It's yours. You know, you can say, save me, forgive me. Nothing wrong with that. But it's not in the words. It's in the, it's in the being persuaded that that's who he is. And, if, and you, if you think, I don't have what it takes to be persuaded, well, just ask him to persuade you. He's the persuader. You're the persuadee and has passed out of death into life. And so we add to our definition, grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power of God to forgive, save, and transform forever. And then we conclude with broken and sinful lives. Grace comes to not just those who are all put together and you know, the Pharisees were the most righteous men in Jesus' society. They were thought as the top of the, of the heap. They were men who devoted themselves to carry out every last jot and tittle, every t cross or dotted I and cross T of the law. And yet Jesus called them open graves. You're full of dead men's bones. You're full of corruption and decay. But to the demoniac and the garrisons, to the woman caught in adultery, to the woman at the well who had had five husbands and now was living with a man, to Matthew the tax collector, to the ten lepers, or the, the ten lepers who came to Jesus, to the leper who came running to Jesus, throwing a, all caution to the, to the wind and saying, if you really wanted to, Jesus, you could heal me. And Jesus says, I really want to be healed. He gave grace to everyone. He gives, he, he talks about, Jesus talks about bruised reeds and smoldering wicks in that day they would the kids would take reeds and cut them from the edges of the lake or, or so on then they would fashion whittle them and fashion them into flutes but if it was bruised if it had a mar in it, it you couldn't play any music out of it and so it would just be thrown away and, until you got one that was whole and good and then you could make it into a flute in the same way um, smoldering wicks were they had a uh, flax wick that was in oil and if the the wife would be the one who was attending to that if she got distracted and the wick burned all the oil down then it would just become this smoldering wick and this apparently the stench of a smoldering flax wick wick was horrendous and all you could do was get it out of the house as quickly as you could and Jesus uses that to describe us that sometimes our lives are smoldering wicks that all you can do is just throw them out on the garbage heap. We're bruised re reeds. We have no purpose left for our life. Yet it says he does not cast aside bruised reeds or smoldering wicks. He loves the most dastardly amongst, amongst us. He loved me. And he loves you. And so that grace is undeserved, un unmerited. It's kind and generous to the least of these, to the most broken and sinful amongst us. It's open to everyone. And really, we're all on level ground. I come to Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There was no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. I like to say, we have together become worthless. There is no one good. There is no one who does good, not even one. 
Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We could turn this to say, our throats are open graves. Our tongues practice deceit. The poisons of, of vipers is on our lips. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Our feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark our ways in the way of peace. We have not known there is no fear of God before our eyes. And that describes every human being on the planet. And all of what I just read is recorded in the law in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Scriptures. And so people want to live by law. Paul is saying, look, what, look at what the law says about every human being on the planet. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. We have all turned away. We have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So who is not in need of grace? I think in this culture we are starved for grace because everything is by performance and merit. You do a resume and what are you, you doing? You're shouting out your performance, your merits, your achievements, your work history. And we have to do it. But we import that thinking into the church. That we have a resume for God and boy is he going to be pleased with me. No, we're starved for grace. We're always in want of grace. A kind word, some power to lift my head, some power to bring encouragement in the midst of discouragement. That voice that says in the midst of our certainty that we are complete failures. You are a success in me because of what I've done for you. Welcome home, good and faithful servant. No, there's no one beyond the pale of the reach, beyond the reach of his grace, beyond the pale of his grace. Not even you, no matter what you've done, because it's unmerited, undeserved, it comes to you. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he has graced you. And so we see the full definition that grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power of God to forgive, save, and transform forever broken and sinful lives. Wow. And it's that grace, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not a, as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's by that grace that we are saved, that we are transformed, that we are forgiven. And so again, Grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind, and generous power of God to forgive, save, and transform forever broken and sinful lives. I, I think of this grace in my life. Sarah and Michael Hedges were here uh, last Saturday, and, and they came by to see Jacques before we put him down to say goodbye to him. And then they sat on our couch, and we just started visiting, and and... We kept visiting, and it was such an encouraging time just to sit with them and enjoy their company. And and uh, we talked, and our conversation got deep. And then it got to be about 7.30, and we thought, well, I'm getting hungry. Are you guys hungry? Let's order out some pizza. So we got pizza, and even that was grace because when Nicole went to pick up the pizza, they had forgot to put cheese in the crust on the pepperoni, so they were remaking it to put cheese in the crust. And so they gave us that extra large pepperoni. So we had a Hawaiian, two pepperonis, one with cheese in the crust. And it was only for four people. I can't eat pizza, and Nancy can't eat it. So it was for Nicole and my mom and Sarah and Michael. And and it was that super abundance again. Suddenly we had this super abundance, and, and uh, we were able to send that pizza home with uh, Sarah and Michael that you know, during that time of talking with them, I, I told them some of my stories, and I probably shocked some of them and, and my daughter as well. But I look back over where I've come from, and I'm so very grateful for the power of His grace. I remember a time when I'd gotten drunk downtown in Seattle 
wildly drunk. We'd gone to one of the kind of the nouveau bars. They were made to have a Hawaiian theme. They had par live parrots in the bar and we were drinking iced teas and I drank two or three iced teas and then whatever else and I blacked out. And I remember one of my friends, we were walking by a, a jewelry store and this friend just kicked in the window of the jewelry store and the alarm went off and we were thinking, what are you doing? And we all ran off in different directions and as a result, I got mugged that night. Woke up the next morning, again, they had hit me in the face and knocked me out. Plus, I had passed out from the alcohol. Woke up in a courtyard with just a, a short sleeve shirt on. No pants, just my underwear. My tennis shoes were still on, and I thought, oh no, how am I going to get home? I'm in downtown Seattle with no pants on. This is one of those dreams, right? You have one of those nightmares. And I, I came out of the courtyard and I saw that I was right next to Tower Records there on Mercer Street, right by where I go to Seattle Cancer Care Alliance now. And so I went and knocked on the door. They hadn't opened yet. And the woman looks at me, the poor young gal working there. And she goes, no, I'm not going to let you in. And I said, I've been mugged. Please let me in. So finally she let me in. And I said, you know, they took my watch, my wallet. For some reason, they they, they depants me as a joke, I guess, because I was so drunk. And so she let me sit behind the counter while I called my best friend Alex's uh, wife, Tammy, and she came and picked me up. And I was so ashamed. So what did I do? I drank more. Used a little more drugs to, care, to cover up the pain. That's who I was, and I repeated those kinds of craziness every two or three weeks for for five years i did that i have so many stories of corruption and brokenness and debauchery and sin and just plain stupidity i'm a bruise reed i'm a smoldering wick but here's the irony so are you We've been bruised by our own choices. We've been bro broken by our own actions, by our own pride, by our own self-righteousness, by our own rebellion. And then came grace. The unmerited, undeserved, kind and generous power of God to forgive us, to save us and transform our lives, our broken and sinful lives. May you know the power of his grace and his gracious power in your life today. Every day, those waves of his grace come crashing into our lives. And as one recedes, another wave comes crashing over us, never ending. No matter what circumstance you find yourself in, his grace is always sufficient because his power is made perfect in our weakness. His power is made perfect in your weakness. So grace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. So that concludes our message today. Next week we'll be actually unpacking Ephesians 2, 8, 9, according to that definition of grace. I hope you can see that I didn't just pick that out of the air, that every component of that definition comes from text, comes from ideas that are inherent in Scripture. Well, thank you again for joining me. Hope we can get the uh, technology sorted out a little bit better than we have. We'll, we'll keep working at it. We'll get to where it, we don't have these blips anymore. But I want to close with this song, You Are My All in All. Jesus, the treasure of treasures, which we can never earn, which we can never deserve, but the treasure that is given to us freely in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's worship. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek You are my all in all 
Seeking you as a precious jewel Lord, to give up I'd be a fool You are my all in all Jesus, Lamb of God Worthy is your name Jesus, Lamb of God concludes our service today. In just about 17 minutes, I'll open the room for our meeting today, and you can join us. Um, if you don't have the passcode or the, the member ID or the meeting ID, you can call me and uh, we'll turn our, on our phones here. And You can call me and I can give you that over the phone. Or, But also you can look on the GCC a private page and if you are not a part of that private page and want to be contact me or contact Jackie Wagner our chairperson we can get you signed up for that let's close in prayer father just I thank you for today I thank you that we got ironed out the lack of sound I thank you for the power of your grace that has transformed each of our lives and we're still in that process of our lives being transformed by the power of your grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that your power to us is kind and generous, overflowing, more than we can imagine. I thank you that it's not based 
at all on anything we've done on our performance, on how we're doing, but entirely on your love and on your power. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for recreating us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for hope eternal. Thank you for the hope of eternal life. Thank you for understanding surpassing peace. Thank you for grace. Thank you for your immeasurable, boundless, illimitable love that you have for us in Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We conclude with a blessing from 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 16 and 17. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.